What's going on guys? It's your boy Dom Camp. Happy Friday. And tonight we have a sports podcast that is going to shock many of you and probably pique a couple of you guys' interests. First and foremost, if you have not listened to my podcast on Super Bowl 52, Philadelphia Eagles versus New England Patriots, I do my prediction in that podcast. I will have a link down below in the description if you haven't seen or listened to it yet. At this stage, guys, Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday on the 4th of February is going to be absolutely crazy. But, guys, we have some NFL news for you guys. That's the only reason I'm talking about Super Bowl Sunday. So let's go right into it. A couple of the Hall of Fame class, guys, inductees. Possibility for them to get inducted is, one, wide receiver um, Randy Moss. Number two, linebacker Ray Lewis. And number three, Brian Erlacher. Pretty interesting, interesting, interesting right there, guys. What do you guys think about those picks, and do you think they are first ballot? Moving on, we're going to be jumping to some NFL headlines, guys. The Eagles, Jernigan, illness, back at practice. Let's see and listen to what happened here with, with the defensive tackle for the Philadelphia Eagles. Tim Jernigan returns to practice after battling illness. The Philadelphia Eagles got a key member back Friday as starting defensive tackle Tim Yernigan returned to practice field after being sidelined since last no late last week with an illness. Jernigan is one of several players and coaches that has been battling a bug. And I quote, I'm getting over it right now. It's like a cold, dude. I don't know. The whole team has it, though, said linebacker Michael Kendricks on Thursday who clarified that he didn't mean that literally everyone on the team is sick. Cornerback Ronald Darby missed Thursday's media session with an illness, but has practiced in full all week. Running back Jay Ajayi, ankle, defensive tackle Fletcher Cox, calf, and linebacker and Donald Nellerby, hamstring, were also full participants. The Eagles kept to their normal practice schedule this week and on Friday focused on red zone and short yardage situations. The padless session lasted about an hour and a half. Coach Doug Peterson opted not to have his players in pads this week, wanting to keep them fresh this late in the year. Afterward, Peterson stood near midfield surrounded by his players, coaches, and front office executives and delivered a lengthy speech according to the pool report. And I quote, Play loose. Have fun. Enjoy the moment. He said, relaying his message, these opportunities, as you know, don't come around every year. Also, make sure just to reflect on the season, reflect on the journey that got us here. But just play for one another. Have fun and enjoy it. Peterson's friend and former teammate Brett Favre is scheduled to speak with his players Saturday morning at the team hotel. That will be followed by a half an hour walkthrough at U.S. Bank Stadium, the site of Super Bowl 52. Preparations are nearly complete. So at least we know, guys, that the Philadelphia Eagles are getting back to full strength due to an injury bug actually happening around, guys, which, hey, that's not a coincidence, guys. Yes, the flu is going around. I don't think it was as severe as the th- as the flu, clearly, but it was something that ended up getting Jernigan back at practice now. Happy, happy that he is back, guys. It's going to be interesting on Super Bowl Sunday, so let me know your opinion on the mysterious illness is going around in the locker rooms. Moving on, Ravens, Bissioti, hopefully I said that right, Bissioti, Bissioti, considered firing John Harbaugh after season. Oh, John Harbaugh is on the hot seat, boys and girls. Baltimore Ravens owner, Steve Bissioti, hopefully I said that correctly, I apologize if I haven't, acknowledged that he thought about firing coach John Harbaugh after the team failed to make the playoffs for his third straight season. It was certainly a consideration, but not one that I was inclined to make this year, Abisioti said at Friday's annual State of the Ravens news conference. This marked the first time Abisioti has publicly revealed that he considered parting ways with Harbaugh, who finished his 10th season as the Baltimore head coach. Hired in 2008 to replace Brian Billick, Harbaugh guided the Ravens to the playoffs in each of his first five seasons, including a Super Bowl title in 2012. Since that championship, Harbaugh is 40 and 40 with one postseason appearance in five years. Wow. Hey guys, at least he's 500. (laughs) 
Bisciotti refused to give Harbaugh a playoff or bust in Eric heading into next season. He's under as much pressure than probably he's ever been in his life, and I expect him to keep his chin up and take his positively and his talents and make the most of the, of the, of the season. Bisciotti said, I may as well replace him now if I tell him to make the playoffs or you're out of town next year. That's not the way we run business here. Well, it should be. It should be. It should be. And the reason I say it should be is because the Pittsburgh Steers have made the pay playoffs pretty much every year with Mike Tomlin at the helm. But the Ravens, they have struggled. They have struggled in the past three seasons trying to get into the postseason. And that should mean something to the Baltimore Ravens organization. They should. But then again, I am a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, so I don't think they should change out John Harbaugh. He's not going to get anywhere else. So it's all good with me. Moving on. Kirk Cousins is talking about the Redskins trade for Alex Smith. Here we go. Kirk Cousins says Redskins trade for Alex Smith came as a surprise. Uh-oh. Kirk Cousins had just finished a workout in the hotel gym in Minneapolis when he saw the text message on his phone, and that's when he learned the news. The Washington Redskins had agreed to a trade that ultimately ends the quarterback's career with the franchise. The Redskins will receive quarterback Alex Smith once the trade is official on March 14th. The Redskins will give the Kansas City Chiefs a third-round pick and cornerback Kendall Fuller. Cousins will then become a free agent at the start of the league year. And I quote, I knew it would be a tough decision if it came down to deciding what to do in free agency, Cousins told ESPN's NFL Live on Friday. So the fact that the decision was made for me gave me relief. It certainly was tough emotionally to know I was having to leave a city that I had so many memories. Cousins also told NFL Live that he spoke to several members of the organization the following day, including owner Dan Snyder and coach Jay Gruden. And I quote, Coach Gruden called me the next day and communicated that my desire to draw the process out through March was going to make it tough on them. And Cousins said, they couldn't afford to wait, so they had to make a move. They wanted to do a deal, but because I wanted to go a little longer, it put them in a tough spot. So they made the trade. I understood that. He said, I wish you all the best. We had a good run and look forward to seeing you in the future. Cousins also told Cyrus and Nexim Radio on Friday that the subsequent days since the news were not as bad as you might think. And I quote, it came as a surprise, he told Cyrus. I certainly hadn't heard anything in this league. I learned curveballs come all the time. I expect to be a free agent come March 14th. We will see if the pl Ugh. And if that plays out, if it does, it's a unique opportunity I look forward to. I haven't had a chance to pick where I play since 2007 when I chose to go to Michigan State. Uh, Cousins, a fourth round pick in 2012 by Washington, started the past three seasons and topped 4,000 yards each time. He played the past two years under the franchise tag, but the Redskins wanted to either sign him to a long-term deal or move on. The Redskins named him the starter in August of 2015, at which point then Redskins general manager Scott McLaughlin had said he suggested signing him to an extension. The Redskins with Robert Griffin III on the roster and with uncertainty over Cousins' future wanted to wait. And I quote, I had no idea what was going to happen. Cousins told NFL Live at the time, if the Redskins had come to me with an extension, I probably would have signed it because I didn't know what was going to take place. But after that season, we knew the franchise tag came into play, and it certainly dictated this entire process. The Redskins approached him in December of 2015 when his play was surging about a deal, but under the advice of his agent, Michael McCartney, Cousins wanted to wait. The first offer of the season was for $12.5 million per year, and the and then the best offer was for $16 million per year with $24 million guaranteed. Instead of signing that offer, he made $44 million the past two years playing under the tag. Last offseason, there was no chance he was going to sign through the Redskins. Though the Redskins made multiple offers. And I quote, after the 2015 season, I was ready to do a long-term deal, Cousins told NFL Live. It seemed the team needed more time. We understood that. After the 2016 season was played and offensive coordinator Sean McVay left to go to L.A., I felt I needed more time. There was really no chance of doing a deal at that point. Then we got to this year and I was ready to do something. But I also wanted to take my time and allow the process to work itself out. And it put Washington in a tough spot. They didn't want to wait, so they went ahead and made the trade. So pretty interesting, guys, listening to Kirk Cousins' side of the trade and how he felt about it. 
and how he wanted to sign a long-term deal, but the Redskins were not ready to pull the trigger because if they hadn't seen enough or something like that. So that is my opinion on that, on that guys. What is your opinion on Kirk Cousins' future? Where do you think he's going to go? In my opinion, he's going to either go to the Broncos, the Cardinals, or the Jaguars. Now, Blake Bortles, he just had surgery, and of course, he's going to be staying with the Jaguars, but he can be a backup. And the reason I say he can be a backup is because he's not a starter. He cannot be starting in the National Football League next season, but he probably is with the Jaguars because the Jaguars have faith in him and all that great stuff. No, no. Take him out of the lineup and bring in someone like Kirk Cousins because that will elevate the team's level of play, especially if you're already put into a situation where the defense is great, like the Jaguars, like the Vikings. Teams like that, they need quarterbacks, guys, so... Pretty interesting. Well, with the exception of Case Keenum, Sam Bradford, and Teddy Bridgewater, all, all going to become free agents in this n upcoming season. So that's pretty interesting as well. Moving on, the Ravens GM, Newsom, to step down after the 2018-2019 NFL season. Whoa, what's going on here? So, so it does look like the Ravens are falling apart now. Here we go. Ozzie Newsom will step down as the Baltimore Ravens general manager after the 2018 season. Eric DaCosta will replace him. Owner Steve Bisotti said at the annual State of the Ravens address Friday. Newsom, 61, made the decision to hand over top of personnel role to DaCosta after the 2013 season when he signed a five-year extension. Since becoming the team's top decision maker, after the franchise moved from Cleveland to Baltimore, Newsom had been the architect for two Super Bowl championship teams in 2000 and 2012. And I quote, Nazi will step down as GM and has assured me that he's not going anywhere. BCLT said he will work with me and work with Eric for a smooth transition. He will be the highest paid scout in America when Eric takes over next year. BCLT also said there was a thought about firing Coach Harbour after the season, but he pointed out that he was proud of how Harbour held the team together during losing streak in the middle of the season. Baltimore finished 9-7 and seven last season and has reached the postseason only once in the past five years. And I quote, it was certainly a consideration. Okay, I already read that earlier. Yada, yada, yada. Under much for okay. And under Newsom, the Ravens have drafted 18 players who developed into Pro Bowl players, including one Hall of Fame inductee offensive tackle, Jonathan Ogden, and three potential ones, linebacker Ray Lewis, safety Ed Reed, and linebacker Terrell T Suggs. But the Ravens have struggled with disappointing drafts in recent years. Baltimore selected two Pro Bowl players in the past five years, linebacker C.J. Mosley and fullback Kyle Juzieski. Man, I probably killed that. Sorry. Uh, while whipping on top picks such as wide receiver Brashad Perryman, safety Matt Elam, and linebackers Arthur Brown and Kamele Kodeda. Oh, uh, DaCosta, 46, joined the Ravens in 1996 in an entry-level position and worked his way up to becoming the assistant general manager in 2012. He has continually turned down interviews for general manager positions. Ask what he liked about DaCosta, Urbisiotti <laughs> said, and everything I think he has learned from Ozzy and he's a great leader of the scouts. I like working with him. I think it's pretty evident by the fact that we are getting called every single year to try to get him. And it's a matter of, a matter of its time. There are people running other franchises that got the jobs because Eric wouldn't take it. Moving on. Pretty interesting right there, guys. It looks like the Ravens are trying to go in a mini rebuilding stage. The only, only way I'll say if they have started the full rebuild is if they get rid of John Harbaugh, which I highly doubt it. But moving on. Oh, the Tom Brady rookie card sells for $250,000 on eBay. Somebody just got paid. Somebody just got paid. Wow. Okay. 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 A Tom Brady rookie card sold for $250,000 on eBay on Thursday, shattering the record for the highest price paid for a Brady collectible and second highest price ever paid for a modern-day sports card. The card, a playoff contender's rookie ticket championship version, is one of 100 that were produced in 2000. One of 100 in the world. Holy crap. Holy crap. That's amazing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's amazing. Okay. 
The previous high for a Brady collectible sold at an auction was a game used jersey which sold for $57,500 last February. The only modern day card that has sold for more at an auction than this Brady card was a LeBron Logo Man one of one rookie card which sold for $312,000 in 2016. The card that was sold is in the best condition of those that have been graded. And I quote, for a modern day card, this one has had issues from chipping on the sides to centering to the autograph, said Rick Probstein, the largest volume sports memorabilia seller on eBay with a $29 million in sales on the site in 2017. Whoa, he's making bank, man. Probstein listed the card for Brady Collectible Joe Prizio, who says he bought the card three years ago for 15000 I wanted to enjoy Brady cards, but I also wanted to make good investments, he said. Brady in the card world is now being mentioned in the same breath as Jordan and Mickey Mantle. Prizio has all 135 of Brady's rookie cards, most of them in the best grade. One card he is listed on eBay through Probstein currently has a buy it now price of $500,000. i am going to look at these cards, man. I'm straight up going to look at these right after this podcast. He bought that card and 11 other cards from a dealer for a total of $30,000 in 2011, he said. <laughs> Wait a second. Where's he getting all this money, man? Straight up. Oh, well. As Brady goes for a sixth Super Bowl ring this weekend, there are no lack of auctions hoping to cash in on the buzz. Golden Auctions is auctioning off a Super Bowl 52 family ring with Brady's name on it. It's the first Brady item related to a Super Bowl's ever offered at auction. The security in and out of the locker room will be tighter this year after Brady had his game used jersey stolen following last year's game. An investigation led to Mexico where a journalist was found to have the jersey in another Brady Super Bowl uniform. Man, that man was stealing Brady stuff. But guys, even though I'm not a fan of the Patriots or Tom Brady in general, that's amazing. His card sold for 250000 six figures for a rookie card of Tom Brady. Which was only one out of a hundred that were ever produced in in the year 2000. That is amazing. I would love that money right now. I would just love that. But hey. Oh well. (laughs) Moving on. Finally, we're going to be talking about the Texans, guys. Ooh. X test. Whoa. Next. Texans employee alleges sexual harassment at the workplace. Uh Uh-oh. This isn't good. A former Texans employee alleges she was sexually harassed by the team's former director of football operations and that the team did not respond properly when notified of the allegations. In a lawsuit filed Friday, Christine Grimms alleges that former director of football operations Jason Lowry was part of an alpha male environment where continuous improprieties Okay, let's say this again. Improprieties toward female employees were not punished. She alleges that Laurie pursued a relationship with her almost immediately after she was hired on a 2013 work trip to Nashville, Tennessee. Grimms alleges she was groped by Laurie with him, openly grabbing her butt. The lawsuit also says that in 2015, after Grimms attempted to sever her relationship with Laurie, he openly stalked her at the workplace. According to the lawsuit, Grimms filed a complaint with the Texans Human Resources Department, but the organization thereafter failed to conduct a proper and unbiased internal investigation of Grimes' complaint. The Houston Texans also decided not to <laughs> reprimand or discipline Jason Lowry in any way, other than to merely make a note of the complaint in his file. The lawsuit states, according to the Houston Chronicle, the team parted ways with Lowry on January 16th. The Texans released a statement Friday night acknowledging the lawsuit that was alleging men, among other things, that the club failed to properly investigate and respond to a sexual harassment complaint filed by a former employee in November of 2016. The Houston Texans take complaints of the nature seriously, the statement said. Consistent with club policy, this matter was promptly investigated and addressed at the time the compliment was made. We will vigorously defend ourselves against this litigation. Okay, hold up. Hold up, hold up. Let me read this one more time. One more time. One more time. The Houston Texans take uh, complaints of this nature seriously. Clearly you didn't. Clearly you didn't. If he kept on stalking her and wanting to be around her, you clearly didn't do your job, human resources of the Houston Texans. 
I really can't imagine being a female put in this situation. I cannot imagine it at all. But I can feel for them in the sense of, yes, that is just terrible. Okay. Being stalked in your own workplace by a person you aren't really fond of and things of that sort. Even if it was a person you're fond of, you can't be doing that in the workplace, man. Man, don't play where you stay. It's just that simple. And this guy, Lowry, he's playing where he stayed. But luckily, he's out of the organization. Luckily now, and as of January 16, 2018. But still, man, he was just trying to get at her on a business trip and everything. He's just... Man, I'm about to research this real quick. Real quick, just to end this podcast, I'm going to research if this man had a... <laughs> had a family and kids and all that great stuff and a wife. Let's see, Jason Lowry. Here he is. Okay, let's see. Okay. Oh, no, not that. Okay. Okay, here we go, guys. Okay. Jason Lowry. Oh, Jason Lowry is who we're going to be looking at right now. And see, Jason Lowry for the Houston Texans. Houston. There he is. Okay. Okay, hey, man, let me see this guy, please. Clearly, it's not going to show me an actual picture of him, of course, because he wasn't the main guy. But they do have the front office and staff. But I need to understand, why would you do this, man? Why would you do that? I'm trying to still understand, if a person doesn't want you, leave, leave them alone. Because if you keep pursuing them, they're going to get angrier at you, and they're also going to file complaints over and over again until their voice is heard. This is the only reason this is on ESPN is because of the fact of this. It is because of the fact of this, okay? The only reason it's on ESPN is because the Houston Texans didn't take it seriously. They just said, oh, he's going to be what he's going to be. And then here, it's out on the front page of ESPN. That's on the Houston Texans. They need to understand that if... If they say they're going to take something seriously, then they better take it seriously. Because if they don't, then someone like someone like Christine Grimm's will not nah, Christine or Kristen. I'm not even sure, guys. Okay, but she is someone like her is going to publicize it, and I don't blame her for publicizing it. Trust me. If I was in that situation, man, and nothing was being done to get this person away from me. Then I'm going to make it public too. And I do not blame her. So I respect her for that. But this guy, Lowry, he shouldn't even have been in the workplace. Especially if and after the first complaint. Okay? Really, Houston? Come on. But other than that, guys, I thank you guys for listening to this podcast. If you went on to enjoying this podcast on a Friday night, February 2nd, 2018. Please go ahead down below and... Leave a like as well as subscribing if you are new and want to hear more NFL news as well as NFL season podcast stuff like that. Let me know how you guys feel about this situation in Houston and how literally Christine or Kristen had to go public because the Houston Texans didn't take care of the problem sooner. They waited until they got publicized and then they said, Ho, oh, we take these seriously. Well, clearly you didn't because one of your employees is speaking out. That is it, guys, though. Thank you for listening, and I hope you guys do have a wonderful weekend. I will be coming on Saturday. I'm going to try to make a college football college football podcast. Man, in a college football podcast tomorrow, possibly. I'm not sure yet, but it should be a comparison, possibly. Maybe an NFL comparison to the person who's going to get drafted. You guys might already know who that is. I did a comparison video on him last time. And many of you didn't really like the comparison, but I'm going to make it even better. So, much appreciated to all you guys. Thank you for listening. and Thank you for a wonderful week in sports. And I will be back with you guys tomorrow. Peace, guys.